They first arrived from the east, stomping as they came. They spread across the world, heedless of borders, barging through even hostile territory, as if they already owned it. Although they have established kingdoms in the mountains of Morn, they wander where they please, extorting what they want and taking by force all that isn't freely given. They war constantly, not out of malice, but for profit and sustenance, for such are the rights of the powerful and the strong. They are ogres, and to stand before their collected might is to confront a landslide. G'day folks, it's Michael from Doom and Darkness. In today's lore video, we're going to be talking about the Ogre Kingdoms, the Ogors and or in the future, the Moor Tribe. So I want to make this lore video looking back at the lore of the Ogres in the Old World so that we have a point of reference moving forwards once the Moor Tribes are released. So this video, we're going to cover off on who they were and what they were in the Old World and then the different units as well and this is going to include what's now called beast claw raiders all proceeds from this channel go to charity so please hit the like button and smash the subscribe button all subscribers we automatically entered into the channel giveaways now the law i'm going to be covering off today comes from the ogre kingdoms warhammer fantasy 8th edition handbook and uh, this is written by jeremy vetok and uh, Jervis Johnson himself. So there's a lot of other lore out there in novels and so forth. We're not going to talk or even try to collate that. We're really just going to cover off on uh, what is in this eighth edition book here. So the, f the first thing that uh, we'll cover off on is the origins of the ogres and essentially where did they come from as far as uh, genetically or which God created them and the truth is is that um, no one really knows so there are two theories in this book which uh, are mentioned one is that the elves um, think that the ogres were made by the uh, old ones as were many races in order to combat chaos but they also think that um, naturally they must have been unfinished or rushed and that will account for all their imperfections their brutish nature and um, just how un-elvenly -elven they are. The other theory which comes from the human scholars is that um, ogres and halflings are essentially two divergent races from the one race and that uh, essentially at some point there was a split. One is extremely big, one is extremely small, but both of them have uh, overwhelming desires they are not able to overcome the ogres have an insatiable appetite they must constantly eat and constantly feed while the halflings have a constant need to steal everything they can get their hands on it's not much as far as an origin story for the ogres but it is what it is now an ogre is described as being twice the height of a man so imagine something between 10 and 12 foot tall and uh, many sizes larger in width as well and um, undoubtedly ogres are fat but beneath the fat are great slabs of muscle now another interesting fact and probably um, one of the most critical components of ogres and what it is to be an ogre is the gut and um, this is significant on many different levels for ogre society so the first thing is is that uh, obviously they have an insatiable hunger which is largely driven by the gut every time they eat they feed their gut and the size of your gut is also a uh, symbol of status within your own tribe so the biggest strongest tyrants also have the biggest strongest guts for example um, where I come from, in the work I do, we call it our motor, right? But um, that's just a little bit of fun. Now, the critical part of this and the most significant part of it all is that ogres of vital organs are actually contained uh, behind the gut or in the gut area, right? So not only is it a spiritual part of them and a, a, a societal status part of them as well, but it also is a critical part of their biology. So this is why you always see um, ogres wearing gut plates and not a lot of other armor. So there are two things with that. They need to protect the gut because it's where their vital organs are. Um, and they don't need to protect much else because 
the rest of their body is really just hulking slabs of fat and muscle. So ogres are capable of taking um, quite severe flesh wounds to the remainder of their body and it will have very little impact on their ability to keep on fighting. So as long as that gut maintains intact and they keep that safe, they are good to go. Now in this book, they um, describe a lone ogre as being capable of besting a dozen men in a fight. A dozen ogres being capable of overwhelming an entire village um, and a whole army of ogres essentially being nothing more than a landslide of destruction. And this is certainly represented on the tabletop as well, where you can have uh, something as simple as three iron guts being capable of taking on a whole 20 man unit of whatever it is by themselves. Now the art that's up uh, in front of you now is done by Con Kiotis. I'm uh, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but this is one of my favorite images of all time because I think it really does capture um, the size of ogres and the absolute brute strength as well. And no matter what race you were, whether you were a Saurus guard, a lizard man, a human, a chaos warrior infused by the power of darkness, an undead, whatever it was, um, if you saw one of these ogres with the size of that blade or that hammer bearing down on you, there would be very few creatures that would be able to withstand a blow from such a weapon. And in fact, um, ogres are described as uh, their charge and the weight of them on the charge impacting like a landslide with a single hit being more than capable of breaking any shield wall. And then if uh, they don't manage to break the enemy on that initial uh, charge, they then go into a long, slow grind where having their gut protected by the gut plate, they can sustain many, many wounds without being able to bring them down. So next I want to talk about um, uh, essentially where the ogres began and where they ended up in the old world and uh, the migration that occurred and how that all happened because it is critical to what an ogre is at the moment as most of us understand them. So if you look at the map on the screen, this is a map of the old world and um, there's a, you'll see a large spine of mountains which run down the center of the map. Uh, take your eyes to the east of that and you'll find an area called Cafe, um, which is essentially the old world's version of China. Now, the ogres are um, described as living on the western border of this great kingdom. And um, when you think of Cathay, you certainly can think of it as a great Chinese empire. Although um, there's not a lot of detailed description about what goes on here, but there are many references to the dragon emperor and there are certain uh, references to the power of the dragon emperor's astromancers for example so uh, when you combine those sorts of things it really does create an image in your head of a all-encompassing powerful um, empire with uh, mighty mighty magics and armies at their disposal most of the old world lore focuses on everything to the west of um, of cafe and this is where we find the origins of the ogres as well. So the ogres used to live here on great fertile plains, it is um, described as, where um, herd beasts are in abundance and there was no shortage of food supply at all. And the ogres were able to live on these plains and uh, feed off these beasts and live in a, a state of relative peace. Um, you can imagine there was infighting amongst themselves and fighting with any wild beasts of the area, but certainly they weren't um, known or a threat to any other civilization or um, at war with anyone else at this point. As time, um, as time went on, and the ogre numbers only increased, uh, the consumption of these herds increased, they began to expand and this brought them into conflict with Cathay as well. Now there aren't many descriptions in the book about the size or the scale of this conflict with um, Cathay at all or how this played out, but the most important thing about it is that it's the beginning of conflict between the ogres and Cathay which essentially is the beginning of their story because it's around about this time when the ogres and no doubt everyone in the well notice that there's a bright star 
in the sky and that gradually it was getting brighter and brighter. Something celestial was hurtling towards the old world. As this approached and got closer and closer, it got bigger and brighter until it may have seemed like a second sun was in the sky and eventually it impacted. Now, unfortunately for the ogres, the place in the old world where this falling comet impacted is was on their great plains and their homelands and it wrought nothing but almost total devastation. So majority of the ogre population was wiped out and um, uh, the gaseous tails or trails from the comet when they hit the ground and after the fallout essentially created a giant barrier between the western border of Cathay and the rest of the old world. And so that's one of the reasons why it's speculated that in fact this comet was brought down to the old world by the astromancers of Cathay. I personally can't really see that there would be any truth to this because um, when you find out the actual nature of the comet you would think there would be no one on this earth that would willingly bring down such an entity upon them but let's continue so the um, ogre population is almost completely destroyed it is only really the ogres that are left on the fringes of the plains away from the impact site that are able to survive that initial um, shocking event but it continues on from there and their beautiful plains all of the herds they used to prey on are pretty much completely wiped out and they now find themselves in a desolate wasteland those remaining ogres uh, go through a real mad max survival of the fittest where food is scarce the environment is harsh and hostile and those ogres that are weak do not survive now, eventually after some time of um, living this way and this being the way of ogre existence, those ogres which are remaining, which are super strong and, um, and have survived so far, have no choice but to move to the west towards the mountains of Morn. Now, um, we can't go east into uh, Cathay because uh, the poisonous fallout from the comet impact is barring that way so to the west they go and this is called the great migration where pretty much all the ogre tribes that remain leave the um the waste and head into the mountains of morn uh, what they find here are um, icy peaks and mountains uh, a size which are beyond imagination uh, where the peaks are well above the clouds but what's most important is that here they find food. Now there are many uh, dangerous beasts. There are cockatrices and chimeras and uh, mournfang which live in the, in the caves on the mountains and so forth. And so the ogre tribes have to both navigate the harshness of the environment but also survive um, their confrontations with all these creatures. They want to take shelter in the caves but they very quickly find that the caves are inhabited, inhabited by creatures at best left alone. Higher and higher um, up the mountains they continue to climb as they are looking for uh, food and also a suitable place that they can call home. And it's once they breach the clouds that they find an essential nirvana. They find these herds of um, elephant or mastodon like beasts which provide, well, not, well they are dangerous but um, they're relatively docile and they provide a uh, smorgasbord of food and meat for the ogres and so the ogres settle in here and um, start feasting upon what seems to be domesticated herds and it is this that draws the ire of the sky titans and this is where the ogres meet the sky titans now the sky titans live in the mountains of morn above the clouds on the peaks but they are a solitary giant or titan um, I imagine these creatures to be something between, uh, to use a Dungeons and Dragons reference, something between a storm giant and an actual titan itself. So the sky titans live up here. They have their own herds of domesticated um, animals, which are, you know, almost giant in size, like I said, sort of mastodon or elephant size themselves. But they live by themselves. So each peak of a mountain is essentially the home of one sky titan. And um, they have carved these giant 
palatial type buildings into the side of the mountain tops. So they notice at first that their herd are disappearing. Something is eating their herd. And when they go to investigate, they find the ogre tribes, tribes now glutting themselves on uh, their domesticated herds. This obviously leads to um, battle and the Sky Titans and the ogres go toe to toe. However, in each instance and in each battle, it's a situation where you have one Sky Titan essentially against a hundred odd ogres. And despite the Sky Titans might, um, the ogres are able to overcome them through strength of numbers and throw them down one mountaintop at a time. And so this begins a uh, the battle for the skies where the ogres move throughout the mountains of Morn conquering one mountaintop at a time. And in fact, it's sort of described that a sky titan on one mountain peak will look across at another mountain peak where the ogres and that sky titan do battle. Um, and even though they're watching their fellow sky titans die mountaintop by mountaintop, they never become involved because of their uh, hermetic sort of nature of the sky titans. Now, one thing that doesn't necessarily quite sit with me when you translate the law across to the tabletop and so forth is that the um, the Iron Blaster itself is meant to be a cannon of the Sky Titans. This is uh, a cannon that they have taken from the Sky Titans and then strapped onto a chariot. But when I look at the size comparison, uh, how the Sky Titans are, are described in the law compared to the Ogres, it doesn't quite match up, but that's really neither here nor there. Now, this era where the ogres are conquering the mountains of Morn and uh, throwing down the Sky Titans has always been one of the eras which has captured my imag imagination the most. And I always wished back in the days of Warhammer Fantasy that um, a Sky Titan would come out or be released or something like that, or that Sky Titans would be brought back into the game um, as such, because we have the giant, the big lumbering owl guzzler giant, but apart from that, there are no other real giant representation in the game. And I personally, um, just from a law perspective, would love it if something like the Sky Titans still actually existed. And there are um, references in the book which talks about um, the last of the Sky Titans essentially uh, lifting off into the sky um, on their um, on their mountain top. So not necessarily any reference to a spaceship or anything like that, but more if you were to think about how cloud giants traditionally live in the sky on floating castles of rock is more what is described as being witnessed by some of the ogres, but this is not definitive and more um, urban or ogre myths. Now the ogres lived up here on the top of the peaks after deposing the Sky Titans for quite some time and um, thoroughly enjoyed the fruits of their labor. But um, one thing that they found is that living up at such altitude was not good for them. And the impact from the comet had sent particles of, well, almost like chaos particles up into the sky and the atmosphere. And the fallout from the comet at, quite, at such heights had was having a real impact on the ogres themselves. So majority of the ogre tribes, not all, but majority of them descended back down below the clouds to live in the valleys below of the mountains of Morn, but not all. And it's, in fact, some lived above the cloud line still. Now, one thing that is mentioned here is that for many of the ogres that remained above the clouds, this combination of the harsh conditions, the atmosphere and also the particulate fallout from the comet that hit the ground and there's much more to be talked about the comet as we progress actually warped them and mutated them and it was those ogres which transformed into yeti so their skin color changed they grew fur and sharp talons and become became quite wild beasts so the origins of the yeti from beast claw raiders um in this book are linked back to ogres. They were once ogres which were mutated and that's how the race of yetis began. Now as the tribes settled into the valleys of the mountains of Morn, um, the valleys themselves actually became the tribal boundaries of each tribe and in fact the extent of a single tribe's territory is determined purely by 
how far an ogre tyrant can see. So um, ogre tyrants, or sorry, ogre tribes are ruled by ogre tyrants and um, no surprise, but in this society, might is right. And the largest and the strongest, or even the canniest ogre that's able to influence and defeat uh, all the other ogres around him is the one that is the tyrant and one that everyone listens to. Now, um, its might is right. So at any point, any person can challenge the tyrant for his position. And this normally involves both of those ogres going toe to toe in a pit and um, whoever loses gets eaten. So it's extremely brutal. But what this means is that a tyrant that rules over a tribe has no doubt had um, a dozen or so such challenges and victories. And so he is a an ogre to be feared indeed. In fact, it actually says that some of these tyrants have thrones made purely out of the bones of ogres they've defeated it, defeated in these challenges. And ogres are not necessarily a short-lived creature as well. Um, while it doesn't give specifics on how long an ogre may live, it does say that it is not uncommon for an ogre to um, sire several genera generations of children in which grow up and as they're of the best stock, they grow to ogres which then challenge them. him, he then has to kill them and eat them. And so it could be that an ogre tyrant has in fact beaten many of his own sons in challenges and subsequently consume them as well. So each tyrant's um, territory is defined by how far he can see in the valleys. And this works quite well because you have one ogre tribe per valley and you think, I mean, these valleys are enormous. But when you look around in all directions, you just see mountain. So you have natural borders. Um, and in fact, a tyrant can expand his territory simply by craning his non-existent neck to look further than he's ever looked before and thus claim the territory. But this means that anywhere where there is a pass or a break in the mountains, these, these are areas where two ogre tribes will go to battle and it is always bloody. If I can see that area of land, then it's mine. And if there's a break in the mountains, then that means undoubtedly, undoubtedly two ogre tribes can see the same ground and that can only mean war. So outside of the uh, interactions amongst ogre, ogre tribes, um, ogres very quickly move into bullying every other race in the region as well. Now, ogres are not mindless. They may be called idiots, but they're not mindless savages. And they will not always just choose to fight and to consume their enemies. So, for example, if there are human villages within an ogre's territory, well, the ogre tyrant and his war band will approach the village and bully them into donating a tithe the villagers will be given a very simple choice, surrender all of your food or become food yourself. And ogres will generally operate this way where they will move about and for all of the species within their territory, they will bully them into providing them with food before they just outright kill them and eat them. However, if someone is uncooperative, well, it's down the gullet they go. This will apply to orcs, it will apply to skaven, it will apply to humans, it really doesn't matter. If there are any uh, roads or trade routes or anything like that that may cross through the passes, then the... And if you could convince the ogres that it would be uh, in their best interest to accompany your caravan as opposed to just eat you and take everything that you've got, then um, then you could hire them as mercenaries and you could be assured that for the rest of your journey, nothing is going to bother you while you have a dozen ogres accompanying your caravan. So ogres found themselves in this unique position where they're certainly a force of destruction. They have some horrible traits such as cannibalism and eating absolutely everything, but yet they're able to exist and coexist in some ways with um, other civilizations, although in a very bullying manner, and in some instances be taken on as mercenaries as well. So where you have the orcs, which are just about war and destruction, but still very much a might um, is right sort of situation, ogres very much sit somewhere between the orc and the human as far as their nature goes. The dynamic I just explained um, is pretty much the dynamic for ogres 
to exist and fit in the old world for all of time ever since they moved to the mountains of Morn and settled in and there are some significant events that happen along the way um, mighty wars that they had to go head to head with chaos invasions which came down from the north and some of these cause uh, are significant moments within the ogre kingdoms time frame as well because a large number of the ogre tribes had to band together to go forth and do battle with them i'll talk about them more as we progress but that dynamic of living in the valleys of the mountain of morn um, bullying all of their neighbors around them extracting tolls from the humans eating everything they could unless uh unless they could get humans to just constantly feed them for example is the dynamic or the status quo for ogres. Now, um, the other most important thing that I need to start talking about is the Great Moor, and this is the comet that fell from the sky. Now, the comet that fell from the sky and impacted the ogres' homeland on the plains is, um, well, it is a deity or an entity. However, its origins are never really described, and it uh, is very different from a lot of the other gods that we see in Warhammer. So um, in some ways it has a similar nature to some of the Chaos Gods, but you'll see as I get into the description that it really is quite different. So um, ever since the uh, comet hit the ground, the Ogre race was overcome by an insatiable need to feed something at their very not just hunger but something at the very core of every ogre which drove him to a gluttonous need to continually consume and so ogres are constantly eating constantly killing in an effort to fulfill this eternal hunger that they have now before all of the ogres left the uh, the badlands as such um, one ogre tells of, uh, sorry, one ogre, there's a legend tells of one ogre called Groth Onefinger. He's a prophet amongst his kind, and he leads his tribe across the Badlands towards the impact site. So he, as a prophet amongst his people, understands that what has fallen from the sky is more than just a rock or a comet, but there is something there. There is a new God. There is something that is calling him. And so he leads his tribe across the treacherous paths towards the comet impact site. He has to obviously uh, lead his tribe through the hunger and starvation of walking through this desolate wasteland. As long as the feral beasts that, that live there, the poisonous winds and so forth, but um, when he gets there, uh, he sees something which is ingrained on the minds of all ogres from this point forward. And I very much have to make a 40k reference here. If you listen to the 40k law, you very much uh, hear about these psychic occurrences which are universe-wide or race-wide and they leave a psychic imprint they're that powerful and this event with Groth staring down at the moor I feel is very much like that this is such a critical moment and has such an impact that it scars the race for the rest of time now this next segment is direct reading from the book I think it's the best way to summarize quickly what the moor actually is and um, what Groth saw when he got there. So as they neared the impact zone, the fierce wind suddenly changed. Instead of swirling aimlessly, the wind now rushed inwards towards the crater's hole. So strong was the pull that the ogres had to fight for every step, lest the intake sucked them into the great pit. When Groth and his tribe reached the edge, hunkering down and gripping the edge for dear life, what they saw was astounding, and has since been depicted on countless gut plates and banners and is forever etched into the consciousness of the ogre race. The gaping hole that stretched before Groth was immense, like some newly grown inland sea, except there was no water within, only empty and plummeting darkness. Its edge was filled with ridge upon ridge of jagged teeth and rippling, convulsing muscle that stretched down into vast nothingness. Here was a gullet so bottomless it could swallow the ogre race into oblivion and still hunger for more. Groth and some few survivors return with tales that filled the remaining ogres with awe. 
Thousands of years have since passed, but many ogres still follow the footsteps of Groth, for the Great Moor exists there still, a vile, pulsing god visited upon the world by vengeful heavens. Not all who take that journey return, for the trip is deadly. Where once vast herds graze, now giant razor-limbed insects lurk, waiting to burst from under the wasted land to attack unwary prey. Large carrion birds ride high on the thermals above, keen eyes searching for the next meal. Most deadly of all, however, is the Great Moor itself, for it still hungers. The presence of the Great Moor writhes in the minds of all ogres, beckoning them to return. To stand upon the mighty precipice so ogres have become a restless race forever seeking to escape from that whisper in the back of their minds that pulls them back to their gluttonous yet insatiable god some ogres those that have traveled around the globe even claim that there is another moor in the ocean on the far side of the world a vast fanged whirlpool that devours any ship that strays too close yet no distance is great enough to escape the pool and lure of the great moor no ritual or feast can fully appease its eternal appetite and whilst it hungers still its barbarous sons will feed and feed and feed until they consume the world so i just quickly want to speculate on the nature of the great moor at the moment because uh, no doubt some people have got many questions i have certainly always questioned the very nature of it and this relationship there doesn't seem to be any link between the great moor and the ogre race almost except for the sheer fact that of the location of the impact of the comet and that in some way at this being the ogre's homeland and then being present at the time of this trauma the moor being an entity has in some way claimed the race um it could i guess be suggested that the ogres had an insatiable hunger just by their very nature of being huge beasts prior to the moor um arriving and perhaps in some way uh they summoned it to themselves however there's nothing that i've ever found that backs that up in any way but it's a, a plausible link for sure um Alternatively, the very nature of the Moor in some ways could be linked to one of the Chaos Gods. It is gluttony. It is an insatiable, insatiable need to feed. And um, that sort of vice or avarice surely has a link towards Slanesh. However, in the old world and in the lore, Chaos Ogres are a real thing. So these are Ogres which will swear allegiance to Khorne or Slanesh or Nurgle or one of the other entities. And if um, the Great Moor was a Chaos God or was an aspect of the Chaos Gods, then um, naturally the Ogres themselves would be a force of Chaos by their link. However, they aren't. They are something unique. They are a force of destruction that are eternally linked to this being. So the the nature of that relationship is um, is really quite unknown and has never really made sense to me other than it fits the race itself. The Moor being um, a comet that fell from the sky that embedded itself into the earth is this giant gaping hole of teeth and muscle and sinew, however, it makes no sense to me. But one reason is because I'm a geologist and um, let's not try and combine real life science with our magical world. So from here, we've got a pretty good understanding of the god or the deity behind ogres the insatiable drive to eat that um that drives them on we know where they live and we know the journey that took them there as well so now we're just going to go into um a description of some of the unit types now like i said before there are very significant events that happen throughout time which helps to define the law of the ogres but we're not going to go into it in this video so um, i've already spoken about tyrants and uh, how they come to be uh, their power but one thing i will just say is on the tabletop um, they are very representative of the law so in warhammer fantasy a tyrant was absolutely devastating um, just just such a powerful hero uh, to stand you know in your units and also in age of sigma currently they're one of the most powerful units as well so um, i like that the when it, the law translates across the tabletop next up we have bruises and bruises are something which we don't see are in age of sigma they are something from the old world but essentially they are the uh, next in line or the right hand men 
of the ogre tyrant. So if you think of an iron gut, which is an elite uh, heavy armor plated ogre warrior, um, he's a massive veteran. He continues to grow in size and eventually he becomes a bruiser. And it is normally from the ranks of the bruisers um, that the challenges for the position of tyrant come. So um, the bruisers are the enforcers as well of the tyrant. They keep all the other ogres in line. They're his captains, if you will, uh, but he also has to keep a close eye on them because he knows that inevitably it will be a bruiser which challenges him and uh, either kills him and takes his um, role one day. So that's the bruiser. We don't need to talk that much about them but we do need to talk about slaughter masters and butchers now um, butchers are both the wizards and also the priests of the ogres by the law so they have a special connection to the um, the moor and they are responsible for preparing the great feast that ogres are so fond of so you can imagine they have a war um, they have a battle they slaughter everyone um, they bring all of the corpses, everything together. I mean, a lot of them just start eating straight away, but it is the butcher that then prepares a great feast, which is not only a celebration of the victory, but also a celebration of the moor. So they're not only the uh, priests of the ogres, but they're also the wizards. They have access to magic. And one thing that they do is they are, ex they are experts at knowing which bits of which animals to chop up to um, help to, to help their magic to grant certain powers. This is reflected on the tabletop by the um, butcher reaching into his cauldron and depending on what sort of guts he pulls out, it uh, will determine what sort of magic goes off on the, on the tabletop. One interesting thing about um, butchers is that they're the only ogre that doesn't wear a gut plate. They entrust the protection of their guts and their uh, vital organs uh, purely to the Great Moor. Now there is an absolutely horrible, horrible description in here of how a butcher comes to be. Essentially, if you have an infant that conforms to all the recognized portents, that baby is handed over to the butcher. And the first thing he does is he bites deep into the baby's stomach or the infant's stomach to then claim that baby as his own. From there, and as the baby, it does obviously doesn't kill the baby, but from here, they feed the baby ceaselessly. It just a non-stop, non-stop feeding this child so that it grows huge and fat. But for ogres, that is also strong. Once the child is then super fat and strong, they go through all manner of different sorts of rituals, not only teaching them uh, magic in the ways of the moor, but also feeding them toxic uh, substances and rotten meat and this sort of thing so that the uh, child, the future butcher, can become immune to all manner of toxins and poisons as well. So um, I guess that's the ogre way, but it's a pretty horrible sort of existence. Now the strongest of the butchers, uh, only the absolute cream of the crop, ever granted the um, title of Slaughtermaster and uh, it would not be uncommon for a slaughter master to rule a tribe or an army in the place of a tyrant. But I just want to stress how few and far between um, slaughter masters are. They really have to be uh, an ogre of legend, a butcher of legendary status in order to be given a slaughter master um, name. Now, there is a second uh, type of priest uh, or wizard within the ogre kingdoms, and these are called the fire bellies. These are, well, few and far between. They don't actually worship the Moor, but they worship the Fire Mouth, which in the mountains of Morn is the largest volcano in the mountain range. So if you think it's like, I imagine it's like Yellowstone, right? It is a uh, volcano of almost world ending proportions. Um, well, not quite. But um, so these priests and wizards worship the volcano as opposed to the Great Moor. And their initiation, um, well, not only do they have to consume, uh, it's quite funny, the most fiery substances they can, um, they have to consume this this intolerable um, concoction of super, it's not actually like super chilies, but I'm just going to say it for the sake of being of fun. But then after that, they actually get lowered down into the volcano 
and they have to swallow molten rock. Now, by this point, you have to um, think that the fire belly's stomach is so conditioned to eating the hottest and, and being able to stomach the hottest stuff in the world that they take it to the final test which is swallowing molten rock themselves and um, naturally no ogre could survive this unless they were blessed by the fire mouth itself so um, once you get to that point you lower down into the volcano all your hair on your body is burnt off permanently your skin is is burnt and scarred you brought up you have your molten rock with you you stomach that and if you survive by the blessing of the fire mouth you then become a fire belly which is essentially an ogre fire mage which i think is really really cool now the next uh, hero that we have in an ogre army is the hunter so the hunter essentially if you imagine a bruiser so he's not a tyrant um, but he's certainly not just an iron gut he's something in between um, but he lives a solitary life away from the tribe in fact most of them no longer have associated themselves with the tribe they live independently and alone in the wilds and in the snows and um, specialize in stalking and hunting their prey and as such they're constantly armed with a multitude of different weapons right an ogre hunter carries every weapon that he could ever possibly need to bring down any um, sort of beast that he might possibly find in the wild even though they don't belong to a tribe they certainly visit the tribes though because hunters are a welcome visitor to any tribe for two reasons hunters bring down the biggest prey so you can think there's a hunter in the wild he brings down a stone horn or a thunder tusk by himself and one carcass of such a beast is too much for one ogre so what they often do is drag it back to a tribe for the whole tribe to enjoy now this doesn't necessarily have to be that hunter's origin tribe some will bring it back to their origin tribe others will just bring it to any tribe that they want to visit and so when a hunter rocks up he often brings with him a carcass of a mighty beast and as the tribe feasts they are regaled by the great stories of the hunters of all of their battles in the wild the beasts that they fought and so forth now um, hunters are also sometimes accompanied by saber tusks now uh, you could think of um, uh, saber tusks as being a domesticated pet of the hunters but this is probably not necessarily true it's more like both the saber tusk which is essentially a saber tusk tiger that's used to living in the snow um, and the hunters having a mutual understanding and a mutual relationship they both hunt each other uh, sorry hunt each other help each other bring down prey that they individually might not be able to bring down and both of them profit through um, the uh, the meat and the food that they get as a reward next up we have the ogres and the ogre bulls themselves and um, well they make up the bulk of any army or any tribe and they are extremely big and extremely brutal and extremely violent however one thing you have to just think about with ogres is that uh, they are always looking out for themselves and they are very random in how they'll behave so um, it can be said that ogres are either above or below morals no one's really sure but they're seemingly devoid of them so for example um, you never know if there is an ogre tribe in the area and that their area their valley is being invaded whether or not they might just perhaps side with the invaders or perhaps they'll fight against them or perhaps they'll wait until both sides have fought it out and then kill whoever is left you really don't know how ogres are going to behave in these sorts of situations they're normally armed with quite crude equipment um, being clubs and uh, swords whatever it is that they've been able to salvage from um, their victims but they would never be so uncouth as to just have a tree branch for example so um, it's almost a point of ogre pride that once you find your club you must uh, tack some uh, metal spikes onto it or wrap some metal bands around it um, and especially try to you know find that sweet spot of the club and then make it better by adding a giant uh, spike onto it or something like that and it's these crude additions 
uh, of technology onto, you know, weapons that um, the ogres actually take uh, significant pride in. Now, ogres are absolutely fantastic fighters. Like we said before, one ogre is the equivalent of a dozen men and um, they have no problems or dilemmas in just wading deep into the fray. As long as they have their gut plate on and their stomach is protected, they fight almost fearlessly as um, mere flesh wounds and uh, things that would certainly hurt or put a normal man out of combat uh, have very little impact on an ogre. Next up, you have the iron guts. And well, iron guts are essentially ogres and ogres an ogre bull steel um, however they have uh, heavy armor heavy armor in the means of uh, whatever armor they armor they could find on the battlefield tacked onto their body to offer extra protection um, not only this but iron guts are also often hand-picked by the tyrant so you can be an iron gut you can be an iron gut you can be an iron gut this means that iron guts are often uh, family members of tyrants or um, veterans of the army or so forth so the iron gut unit themselves are really quite special so when you get an ogre you give him much more protection and then you give him uh, and then you take him from a certain status within the tribe to be an iron gut this makes for a particularly devastating unit and it's the iron guts that often spearhead an attack or an assault on an enemy um, there's a rule in age of sigma which says leave it up to the iron guts and um, this is reflected in the law as well because when you really need a job done iron guts are the ogres to make it happen the next unit you have are lead belchers and well these guys are crazy often missing eyes because of their use of gunpowder or black powder um, lead belchers essentially are ogres that wield human cannons as handguns so because the ogres are so large that they're able to take cannons and uh, mortars and all sorts of missile weapons um, break them off the carriages carry them around by hand they stuff them full of whatever they can get their hands on ogres uh, aren't known for having forges or making armory they scavenge from whatever they can find and whoever they've defeated and as such they'll often stuff a cannon uh, so tightly with um, broken and rusted and smashed up weapons and arrows and swords or whatever it is that uh, when they light the cannon ignite the black powder it fires a huge cloud of sharp projectiles so this is extremely devastating but it's also very dangerous an ogre if he doesn't have a nobbler to light the fuse for him will have to hold a burning fuse in his teeth the cannon in two hands and then lower the fuse using his teeth down to the cannon to ignite it and set it to fire. So um, this is dangerous for anyone that's standing anywhere near the front of the cannon, but also for the ogre itself, as if you have a hugely tightly packed cannon of, uh, of um, uh, non-aerodynamic material and uh, gunpowder and a fuse in your mouth, well, this certainly makes for some explosive action. Lead belchers are one of the, uh, well, the only foot mounted range unit in the army. And um, uh, unfortunately in Age of Sigma, they're not that good at the moment. So next we have, uh, well, the man eaters, which are personally one of my favorite uh, ogre units about. And man eaters are, because ogres have a certain sense of wanderlust, um, and also have a um, uncertain nature, they often travel far and wide. You can see an ogre, for example, which agrees to be a mercenary on a caravan um, that takes him far away from home. And then once he's there now in the new city, maybe in an imperial city, um, he finds further work. And then as time that takes him further away into different cultures and he learns different skills and different abilities. This is essentially what a man eater is. It is an ogre which has traveled far and wide away from the mountains of Morn and has come back with a whole set of new skills. The models themselves in Age of Sigma are um, some of the best models in the entire game. And they each ogre 
is uniquely different. So one ogre, for example, looks like a ninja. Obviously, he has been to the east and he has learnt his martial prowess there. Another one is dressed uh, in, he's an imperial man-eater. So he has the, um, the feather in his hat and so forth. And he's using a giant uh, hammer from a statue of Sigma himself. Other man-eaters um, are Arabic in nature and they fight with weapons uh, similar to that culture and wear turbans on their head. Other man-eaters are pirates, for example. They found themselves on the high seas and uh, fitting in with pirates. And so what happens is eventually over time, you end up getting groups of man-eaters which will uh, come together as they meet on their travels. And this makes a complete, a, a very devastating unit indeed because they are experienced veterans from far and wide that have a skill set that most ogres don't have. These are truly the most elite of the elite ogres. Next up, we have the Mornfang Cavalry, which essentially are Iron Guts riding a hybrid between a rhinoceros and a bear. So Mornfang are creatures that um, live and dominate the caves high up in the mountains. And they're particularly savage. Packs of Mornfangs are known for being able to uh, tackle and take on any beast in the entire mountains of Morn, some of which are um, considerable in their strength. Um, the other significant thing about Mornfang is that they will continue to fight almost after they're dead. So um, there are blurbs in here which say that even after the brain activity of a Mornfang ceases, the animal will still bite and slash and stab and fight on to a certain degree. So um, Monfang are extremely respected by the ogres and extremely fierce um, opponents. And it was never thought that you could mount them until one particularly particular ogre worked it out. So in the same way that um, ogres have a leadership battle for the tyrant position who will lead them. Mornfang have the same thing. So two Mornfang will battle to see who will lead the pack. And um, once this battle has been completed, this is the time to uh, try to score yourself a Mornfang. So you will climb up into the mountains and you'll creep up and you'll observe the pack. You'll wait until you see one of these battles commence. And then as soon as it's over, you will jump onto the back of the tired and injured Mornfang. That Mornfang will then go crazy. And if you manage to uh, stay on its back after a leadership challenge, uh, the Morn until the point where the Mornfang collapses from blood loss or exhaustion or whatever it may be, whenever the Mornfang does come around, it will at that point bow down to you and be your servant forevermore. And this is how the Mornfang Cavalry are created. So uh, Mornfang Cavalry are probably one of the most devastating shock units in an entire army. And the initial charge of the Mornfang not only kills your enemy, but often just leaves them completely and utterly pulverized. Next up, we have, well, one of my all time favorite units because of the lore, and that is the Gorgers. So what's a Gorger? Well, when an ogre infant is born, without a paunch or without a gut, it is immediately shunned. As I said at the beginning of the video, the gut or the stomach is, um, it is representative of the, of the maw, it protects the vital organs, and it also is a symbol of status. And ogres are actually born with guts. I know, right? How cute. But um, if a child is born and it is lacking that uh, paunch or that stomach, then it, this is a sign of disfavor by the Moor. This is a mutant child and it is immediately given to the butcher. The butcher, the tribe butcher, will then take the baby and discard it into the darkness of the nearest cave. So the mountains of Morn are riddled with cave networks, right? And um, all the way through connecting all the mountains and so forth. Imagine an underground labyrinth of caves, caves and this is where the um, infants are discarded to. Now, um, this is where the gorges live. If that infant manages to survive and through a, a brutal existence of natural selection, living in the dark and sniffing out an existence without any sight, these infants become gorges. 
mindless, savage ogres who live in the dark, live off the scent of blood to hunt their prey. Now, are these gorges obviously dangerous and these mutants are dangerous not only to, well, whatever they encounter, but the ogres as well. So most ogre tribes, when they fi find entrances to these cave systems, will block them up with rocks. They will wall them in to keep the gorges inside. However, in times of war, an ogre tyrant might unblock some of these caves. Once the battle is joined, the scent of blood and the sound of um, clashing steel draws the attention of the gorges and they come pouring forth from the cave entrances to savage whoever they come across. Obviously, battlefield position is pretty important because you would hate to unblock the uh, cave entrance only to have the, gorge, the gorges fall upon your own army. Now, another ogre unit which is not an ogre but is always found with the ogres are noblars and noblars are a not too distant cousin from uh, grots or greenskins as such they stand about up to the waist half the height of a normal man and are vicious little buggers whose damage is only limited by their actual strength noblars accompany ogres and in fact invest infest their camps in the same way that a rat would in many cases. However, ogres um, tolerate Noblar's existence because they find them extremely useful. When you are as big as an ogre, um, it is often advantageous to have these small little creatures living amongst them. They can do things for the tribe that ogres couldn't normally do, and there's a mutual um, and much like a saber tusk, there's a mutual benefit for both species to cohabit. Or you often see on um, the ogre models themselves, they will come with their own little nobbler. The nobbler might be carrying a pack or carrying supplies. He might be helping to load or the um, lead belcher's cannon or holding the fuse or the wick to ignite it, for example. And while a nobbler has found a use for himself, he is safe from being eaten after all. If you're an ogre and you have your favorite nobbler and he's very helpful and he does things for you, well, you're not gonna eat him and you're probably not gonna let any other ogres um, eat him either. However, if, um, so they get a certain amount of protection by hanging around and doing useful. However, if you're a belligerent little nobbler, uh, you are not gonna be long for this world and no ogre is going to object when another ogre makes a meal out of you. Now, Noblars actually have their own war machine, which they can bring to the battlefield, um, which is called a scrap launcher. And essentially it's a catapult uh, that is on, built onto a cart and then strapped to a rhinox, which is a woolly, uh, a woolly version of a rhino. Um, now they load the catapult up with scrap metal and sharp bits and then fling them at the enemy. So you can just imagine um, instead of an individual uh, ball or anything like that coming out of the sky and hitting you, it's just going to fling a whole scatter shot of shrapnel into the enemy. And um, this can be, well, very ineffective or super effective if one of those bits of shrapnel hits a weak spot. Now, the other piece of artillery that ogres have at their um, behest are the iron blasters. Now, I spoke about these a little bit before, and essentially what they are is um, cannons that the Sky Titans once used against the ogres. So, um, a particular ogre remembered uh, seeing one of these cylindrical objects in the rubble of a Sky Titan's fortress and decided to um, go back and find one. He hefted this giant bronze cylinder down the mountain and then strapped it onto the back of a rhinox with a makeshift cart to support it as well. Um, this became the Iron Blaster, which is a cobbled together wagon with an enormous cannon, which could just absolutely fire a devastating salvo at its, at its opponent. So um, in Warhammer Fantasy, these were the shit. They were super powerful and probably one of the best artillery pieces around. In Age of Sigma, they currently don't really have much of a use. They're just not very effective at all. But um, let's see what a new book may bring. Next up, we have the Stonehorns. And Stonehorns are perhaps one of the most revered and respected 
beasts of the mountain and mourn and to the ogres themselves as well so they're a very unique creature where they are almost a giant fossilized creature they are extremely old and they their diet consists almost entirely of rocks and uh, minerals so a stone horn will get its meals by actually headbutting the mountainside breaking away huge fragments of rock or digging with its horns and uh, they prefer to uh, eat you know precious metals or gemstones or uh, anything like that that they can find or uncover through this process of smashing everything apart but they can also just eat and chew mundane rocks as well and it's sort of this process of living on the mountains of having a body of skin and bone which is used to this style of living their age and then their diet as well which makes the stone horn almost a combination between flesh and rock itself now um, this the stone horn will charge pretty much anything it sees so they are extremely dangerous and there are very few things that can halt a stone horns charge and this is one of the reasons why they're so respected because anything that can charge its way through an ogre line is um, worthy of reverence for ogres however the stone horn are the stone horn are ridden by um, by hunters so the only way to do this is essentially a hunter needs to find a stone horn and then get it to charge him and when it charges him he needs to stand in front of its charge and not waver at all and then at the last minute using his spear thrust it forward into the eye of a stone horn now this is the only thing that will stop a stone horn's charge is a spear directly to the eye if the hunter misses well he's dead but if he survives and his aim is true he will see something he may never see again and that is the sight of a stone horn backing away and in pain from here he grabs a hold of the spear and using the pain inflicted upon the stone horn from the spear still stuck in its eye will uh, lead the stone horn to a cave where the stone horn heals but um, as it heals over time in fact the eye may very well grow back itself but as this hunter is the only being in the stone horns existence that's ever been able to inflict pain upon it from that point on uh, he will be able to ride it and it will serve as his mount so um, in age of sigma this is called a frost lord on stone horn but in warhammer fantasy these were hunters which rode the um, stone horns into battle and now finally last but not least we come to the thunder tusks so thunder tusks are a um, unique creature you can imagine a woolly mammoth however a carnivorous woolly mammoth so um, they have these giant tusks which bend down but they also have fang uh, fueled maws and um, these are immense creatures that are a product of a bygone era so um, the ancestors of thunder tusks at one time as the earth warmed they lived in a basically in a, a period of global cooling let's think of it like that and as the climate changed and it warmed they were forced forced towards the northern plains and the wastelands and as any of you that are familiar with um, the old world law know uh, this is where the poles are and this is where the um, the vortexes are where the winds of magic flows from and so the forefathers of the thunder tusk were imbued with magic they have magic infused into their very essence and this is what allows them to conjure the spheres of um, of icy sorceress magic is the best way to um, explain it so let me just read this out for you it's the best way to explain how thunder tusk works thunder tusk are solitary wanderers that travel across the cold places of the world far to the north or high amidst the frozen peaks of the mountains needing a great deal of sustenance to sustain their bulk and icy nimbus they are constantly roaming in search of fresh meat but the thunder tusk is not just deadly up close where it can stomp its frozen foes flat a thunder tusk's horns attract the elemental power of magic like a lightning conductor the beast's icy breath mixes with the sorceress flux coalescing into swirling spheres of eldritch energy and jagged shards of ice 
with a sound akin to a peal of a thunderclap, the Thundertusk can hurl these frozen orbs across the battlefield. Upon in fact, impact, the glowing sphere of frost shatters, sending lightning wreathed icicles spinning through the air. The shards scythe into any exposed flesh, cutting bloody holes into anything within its wide radius. So that's how the Thunder Tusk in inverted commas snowball attack works. A combination of their innate magic that's built into them, their icy breath, and the effect that their horns have on them as well. Now, um, the relationship between ogres and thunder tusks is really a classic one where ogres are able to bring the beast down, severely injure them, and then chain them, beat them to, into submission with clubs, and then continue to basically haul the thunder tusk around with their tribe keeping it in the state of submission and domination until the Thunder Tusk learns to um, act in a way that doesn't get it beaten by clubs. And it's at this point that the two can start to work together and Thunder Tusk can be ridden by ogres into battle. So that's where we're going to finish it up. I'm not going to go through the special characters of the old world. Um, just wanted to give everyone an overview of what the Ogre Kingdoms were before Age of Sigma, um, and then obviously transferred into Age of Sigma, broken up into Gutbusters and Beast Claw Raiders, and then perhaps with fingers crossed, combined again in the future. But we're going to have to wait and see. Um, I really just want to say now that I hope that um, the nature of the Moor and its relationship with the Ogres is in some way carried across. And we do already have some references to the Moor in Age of Sigma as Ravenac, an entity that Sigma has buried underneath a mountain and has now um, been embodied in Ravenac Snatching Moors, which is the endless spell which you can summon, which was, however, you know, first summoned by a butcher. So that's sort of fitting. So we're just going to have to wait and see how that plays out. But if you are new to um, uh, Gutbusters or Ogres or more tribes and wanted to have a bit of a look about where they've come from as opposed to where they are now, um, this will give us a good soundboard. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sorry if I got anything wrong and um, until next time, ciao.